The horned dinosaurs, the Ceratopsians, are a huge and diverse group of dinosaurs that reached their highest diversity during the Cretaceous period. Despite the existence of a solid framework for Ceratopsian biology, a bunch of new and interesting things have been uncovered about their evolution. Over the last 30 years or so, it has become clear that what was thought to be two major groups of horned dinosaurs, the Chasmosaurs and Centrosaurs, is divided into many more groups. The Chasmosaur lineage is now split into various groups evolving in different ways across the western slice of mid to late Cretaceous North America. You've got your heart-shaped frilled Chasmosaurus lineage in the north and a tall pinch-frilled Pentaceratops lineage in the south that eventually evolves into the round, solid-frilled Triceratopsini across North America. On the other hand, the Centrosaur group now contains the bizarre early curly-horned Diabloceratops lineage, the cow-horned blunt-nosed Nasutoceratopsini of southern North America, a Canadian lineage of uniquely frilled forms that managed to migrate into Asia, and the Eucentrosaur group that holds the super spiny frilled Centrosaurini and the boss nosed Pachyrhinosaurini. Many members of both the Chasmosaur and Centrosaur groups are well known. These are the hard benchmark data points for the understanding of these animals. I think the more interesting parts of these family trees are the obscured data points. For example, there seem to be quite a few of the small blunt-nosed Nasutoceratopsines moving more southward across the Cretaceous. There is one named member from Mexico, but a bunch of unnamed ones, and a few are known from Montana, and some recently described remains indicate they were present across New Mexico and Arizona as well. There are a bunch of paleontology projects that were started from the mid-1990s to the 2000s that were wide-reaching in their goals. These sorts of projects ended up being more like surveys of areas rather than more specific dig site-related things. Of course, because of the broad survey nature of these projects, they ended up producing a bunch of dig sites as the experts involved found more and more stuff. Plenty of institutions across the American West did these sorts of things, and the fruits of their labor have been slowly trickling out into publications for decades now, mostly due to the fact that museums and institutions are poorly funded, paleo programs are even more poorly funded, and it can take years to fully prepare and describe any given specimen, especially if they're big. One of these projects was the Fort Crichton Formation Paleontological Project, started in the 1990s by Dr. Robert McCord, curator of the Arizona Museum of Natural History. This project yielded a bunch of interesting information about a layer of rock called the Fort Crittenden Formation, located south of Tucson, Arizona, and dating to the late Campanian Age of the late Cretaceous Epoch, about 75 to 72 million years ago. It was thanks to the information collected by this project that groups of researchers and volunteers from the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum were able to find the remains of a Ceratopsian dinosaur in this layer of rock between the mid-1990s and 2000. This team of dedicated nerds were out preparing a dinosaur specimen in Adobe Canyon, which is in the Santa Rita Mountains in Santa Cruz County, Arizona. Then, in 2000, self-taught amateur paleontologist Stan Kersey-Zanofsky discovered the remains of another dinosaur in the same Adobe Canyon area and from the same rock layer as the mid-90s teen. The mid-90s specimens would go back to the Arizona Museum, while the 2000 specimen would find a home at the New Mexico Museum. It wouldn't be till around 20 years later that the specimens would get a description. The New Mexico Museum specimens would be fully prepared by paleontologist Sebastian Dalman, and then he described all the specimens as a new genus and species, along with John Paul Hotnet, Asher Lichtig, and Spencer Lucas, in a 2018 paper published in the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science Bulletin. When everything was properly prepared and put together, the team was confident that what they had on their hands was a fragmentary Centrosaurian Ceratopsian dinosaur, made up entirely of skull material, which includes a bit of the right parietal, the middle part of the frill, a nearly complete left squamosal, the bottom part of the frill, the back half of a right jaw, some teeth, 
a mid-parietal bar, the part of the frill that ran in between the two holes, another left squamosal, and an epiparietal, the little decorative bones that lined the edge of the frill. With enough diagnostic traits preserved to tell it apart from all other horned dinosaurs, the team decided to name the animal Crichtendinceratops kurzizanovskii. The genus name just comes from the rock layer the dino did, while the species name honors Stan Kurzanovsky. Though this dinosaur is very fragmentary, the few fossils that were found happened to include skull traits that have been used to set horned dinosaurs apart for many decades. This means that, though it is a poor specimen in overall completeness, it is still a relatively useful specimen when it comes to evolutionary data. Speaking of evolution, what the hell kind of horned dinosaur was Cretan Dinceratops? When the research team tallied up all of the diagnostic traits preserved in the Crichtendon ceratops fossils and pit them against the diagnostic traits of all other centrosaurine dinosaurs using the phylogenetic analysis using POP or simply POP program, they found that Crichtendon ceratops placed most closely to an as yet unnamed horned dinosaur from Malta, Montana. Both of these horned dinosaurs formed a grouping that was the earliest offshoot of the Nasutoceratopsini group a group that also includes at least three unnamed critters from Mexico, Alberta, and Montana, plus the Mexican Yawikauceratops, Montanan Fricatoceratops, and Utah Nasutoceratops. Since the publication of Crichtonin Ceratops, two new Nasutoceratopsine dinosaurs have been named, Menificeratops and Fricatoceratops. Plus, Avaceratops has been demoted to just one immature specimen, making it difficult to classify. The two newer dinosaurs have shuffled a family tree a few times. The most recent Furcatoceratops description neglects to include Menificeratops or Crichtendinceratops in its analysis. It found that Furcatoceratops was the closest relative of Nasutoceratops, forming a polytomy of a bunch of blunt-nosed, nose-hornless dinosaurs. In phylogenetic science, a polytomy is simply a tree that splits off into a branch of branches from one point. It shows simultaneous speciation of a bunch of species from a hypothetical shared ancestor, rather than one species evolving into another, or branches that branch off other branches. With the fossil critters, this sort of organization is more reminiscent of insufficient hard genetic data. So, it's hypothetical until more data can be collected. To be more concise, Crichtendin ceratops is most closely related to the unnamed centrosaur from Malta, GPDM63, and Menificeratops, and this grouping is variously related to CMN8804, MOR692, Avaceratops, Furcatoceratops, Yawikauceratops, and Nasutoceratops. Now that we know what it is related to, how might the missing pieces be filled in? Crichtonton ceratops is obviously super fragmentary, it's just bits and pieces of the head. With that in mind, the best hypothesis for what it looked like has to be informed from its closest relatives. All of the Nasutoceratopsines have been found to lack a nose horn. Instead, they had large brow horns. Interestingly, this whole side of the centrosaur tree lacks a nose horn. They only start showing up with the Asian Sinoceratops and Canadian Wendyceratops, eventually being taken to bizarre extremes with the Centrosaurus lineage. Another feature unique to the Nasutoceratopsine tree is a huge, humped snout with enormous hollow cavities throughout. Some researchers hypothesize that these giant holes may have housed a circuitous labyrinth of fleshy nasal tubes to warm up and humidify air as it is brought into the lungs. However, since many of these dinosaurs lived in very warm and humid places already, this idea may not be heavily supported. Another hypothesis is that the nostrils held huge inflatable sacs for communication, though this idea has very little to substantiate it. It is not a huge stretch to assume Crichtonin ceratops had a high humped snout, as in all of its cousins, as well as a pair of forward pointing brow horns. Nasutoceratops probably has the most unique pair of brow horns in the entire horned dinosaur group. They bent out to the sides and then forward and up, like the horns of many cattle breeds. The rest of the group didn't seem to have brow horns this crazy. Instead, they were largely short, blunt, and forward arching. This is what can be conservatively speculated for Crichtonin ceratops. 
What can be confidently reconstructed in the critter are the hornlets that decorated the edge of the frill. Crichton Ceratops had a short, rounded, conservative little frill that had equally short, blunt, bony things sticking out of it. Some of these bones, called epocipitals, almost looked like two that have fused together to form almost molar-shaped little scallops. Now that we have some idea of what the animal may have sort of looked like, how big was it? In order to get an idea of the critter's average estimated size, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme. Based on some very rough math and based on the rest of the body's size from close relatives, some independent researchers and amateurs have estimated Critton and Ceratops was around 3.4 meters, 11.15 feet in length, making it quite small. That's slightly larger, or about the same size as the smaller specimen of Diabloceratops, or smaller than the bigger specimen of the devil-horned dino. Crichton Ceratops would have made a good snack for a large tyrannosaur, if it could catch it, of course. Thanks, Mr. Man. Crichton Ceratops is the first dinosaur from the Fort Crichton Formation to be officially named, but it was not the first to be found. Based on where and when the Fort Crichton Information is, plus the sedimentology of the rock layers, the region would have been of high elevation, with lots of rivers, streams, and deltas cutting through the area. There were active volcanoes in the area at the time too, the biggest and most important of which was Mount Fagan, which is today located near the Rosemont Mine. This small volcano erupted during the Cretaceous. The area, though higher in the mountains than something like the Hell Creek or Hall Lake formations, would have been quite warm and moist with dense forests. Garfish, bowfins, clams, snails, and crocodilomorphs filled up the waterways. Aside from Crichton and Ceratops, unnamed or indeterminate fossils of hadrosaurs and dromaeosaurs have been found. There were likely a few tyrannosaurs present as well, since they are found throughout Cretaceous North American rocks basically not too different from most New Mexican, Texan, and Arizonan Cretaceous rocks. I hope more projects in this region are planned because it would be fascinating to know more about Crichton Ceratops and its world. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.